uh, let me actually do a split screen because um, I guess what I'm mainly looking at is how uh, these questions uh, I wrote them. <laughs> uh, they are not your textbook questions, and um, the biggest reason for that was uh, your textbook didn't have good conceptual questions that I felt that I could use. Um, <laughs> so that's why I wrote this. Um, and as you are looking at this, one reference that you could use, which was linked as part of the pre-lab for this week's lab, is this uh, material. Wait, did I not link it here? Oh. You know, I, I'm a week ahead, sorry. <laughs> and, and, you know, you don't need to refer to this. Um, uh, but, okay, since I mentioned it, it's uh, coming up <laughs> next week <laughs> for, wow, well, wait, not even next week, the week after next week <laughs> uh, for the driven AC circuit. So here I should have, yeah, I think this was also linked elsewhere. Uh, this is uh, something I created uh, way back when I was doing a, circuit to review for, I think it was um, students in American Society of Civil Engineers, but you know, all engineers have to take an exam called engineering training exam, I think. Um, and one component of that exam is circuit. And I was doing the review for them. And uh, this is kind of a summary of the material. Um, and I think uh, some of this is more relevant when you do AC circuit, <laughs> which is uh, why. So you will see this next week. So let me not jump the gun there. And instead, let me just have your textbook here, because I think that's uh, what I should be referring to. Um, so, so let me just read through the question and say one or two quick things, and then we'll go <laughs> if I can. Okay, so it says capacitors, uh, first question, it says capacitors play a certain role in time-dependent circuits that make the circuit time-dependent and behave over time in certain ways. Let me just go to the capacitor chapter. It's a little bit split in your textbook, which is um, unavoidable. <laughs> um, so I think the place where you would be most, um, you would see most relevant material for capacitors is in chapter 10, RC circuits. And we introduced capacitors way back in chapter eight. So just uh, know that the material is spread around um, different parts of your textbook. So this rule summarized mathematically by the definition of capacitance, right? Um, or rewritten in terms of voltage or group capacitor, this. Explain qualitatively what effect the presence of capacitor has on voltages and currents in a time-dependent circuit. So this is the piece that's a little bit um, conceptually a little more challenging than the next question, but you can get to it still with a few steps. So the very first step is this expression here. The voltage across capacitor is directly related to the amount of charge on the capacitor. And the second step you have to go through, um, it's that conceptual step. You know, Imagine you have this circuit with a capacitor, um, capacitor in it. It's going to be accumulating some charge. And what are some of the limitations on um, the values of these charges. And one thing I will tell you is uh, a limitation is that the value of the charge cannot change suddenly. Or rather, um, when you take the rate of change of how quickly the amount of charge can charge on the capacitor can change, it's related to the current through the capacitor through this relationship. Current is the derivative of this Q as a function of time, of time. And unless you have an infinite amount of current, this uh, derivative will be a finite <laughs> value, which means if you imagine plotting out amount of charge as a function of time, you can't have it change suddenly. There has to be a more gradual change. There has to be a finite, um, there has to be a finite, a non-infinite amount of slope, uh, which corresponds to finite amount of current you have available. So this limitation on charge is limitation on voltage um, through this relationship. So anytime you have a capacitor in a circuit 
its primary role will be to basically what, whatever voltage across the capacitor is, it'll maintain that voltage. Or at least it'll prevent that voltage from changing suddenly. Uh, this is in contrast to imagine you only uh, imagine you had a circuit with uh, with only a register, like in this circuit here. Imagine you didn't have capacitor, just a register, and you have zero. Uh, you have um, so the voltage across the register is zero right now. The moment you close the switch to A, the voltage across the register will instantaneously change to this voltage here. But with the capacitor, when the voltage across it was a zero initially, when you close the circuit, this remains a zero voltage uh, difference across. It can't change instantaneously. And the exact opposite thing in the sense of the direction of change happens when you're discharging the capacitor. So you've fully charged the capacitor and you flip the switch to terminal B to make the circuit like this. If it was just a circuit with a register, the voltage across the register could drop to zero instantaneously. Now, with the presence of capacitor, that conflicts with the capacitor's property. That with this amount of charge, there's some amount of voltage across it, and that voltage cannot change suddenly. And that voltage through this connection also becomes voltage across register and all that. So, so that's the role of the capacitor. It has to do with this relationship between voltage and charge. And when you consider what kind of limitations there are on the parameter Q, that translates directly to the parameter uh, limitation on how quickly voltage can change. Okay, next question. Inductors play a certain role in time-dependent circuits that make the circuit time-dependent and people were into over time in certain ways. This role is summarized mathematically by the definition of inductors, right? This is in the summary sheet, but also I wrote it here, so it doesn't need summary sheet. Or rewritten in terms of the voltage induced over the inductor. This, by the way, in this expression, I think I'm basically imagining an absolute value. I'm not dealing with the signs here because they get complicated. <laughs> um, explain qualitatively what effect the presence of inductor has on voltages and currents in a time-dependent circuit. So I think we can just uh, look at this expression and work with them because it relates directly voltage to something that's related to current. So voltage across the inductor will be related to rate of change of current. So whenever you have a situation where the current needs to change suddenly, uh, maybe something like a DC circuit setup where you've replaced the capacitor with the inductor and, um, and you are trying to suddenly change the current. You are closing the circuit, then suddenly trying to put in a current equals the uh, E over R. Then whereas previously the current was zero. Inductor will prevent that from happening because um, how, however quickly you want to change the current, that's uh, however much voltage you will have to impose across the inductor. So unless you have an infinite amount of voltage and eventually you want to <laughs> get breakdown of air and all that, um, the current through inductor can't change suddenly. And this can have a rather interesting effect when you are trying to break a circuit. Because uh, when you're closing the circuit, I think it's fairly uh, simple. Um, the moment you close the circuit, inductor behave. Uh, let me go to a screen with the inductor so that this is uh, in the confusing view. Um, so when you have an LR circuit, so that should be somewhere here, R L RL circuit. Um, oops, sorry. Um, so when you have a circuit like this, and when you are connecting this switch, um, so inductor will basically behave like something that has infinite resistance. Uh, because the moment you close the switch, zero current, it'll remain at zero current. Um, and um, the amount of voltage that you are able to impose across the inductor, basically the entire voltage of the battery because of zero current means zero voltage drop. That voltage will cause current through the inductor to be able to change at this rate. And with that, uh, more current flowing through the inductor, that means voltage drop here and 
that leads to all the <laughs> wonderful differential equations. So let's say you have some steady state uh, with this. Now, when you try to break this circuit, as in like uh, introduce a circuit break here, that causes some interesting effect to happen. Because when you try to open up the switch, you're basically trying to go from some amount of current to zero instantaneously at a moment in time. And again, um, this prevents that from happening. And it's a kind of a paradox. And the paradoxes in physics always have to resolve. And the way it resolved is that there's some kind of maximum amount of voltage that will be induced across inductor. And at that maximum amount, some kind of arcing happens between contacts of the switch. And um, so, so the current does continue to flow through that breakdown of dielectric breakdown of air. Um, so, so the in short, the role of inductor is that it prevents the current from happening sudden, uh, from changing suddenly, uh, whether suddenly turning on or suddenly turning off. It can only change current through inductor. Can only change gradually at this rate given by voltage across inductor. Okay, uh, question three, the parameters, RC and LR, um, you know, maybe I can skip this. Uh, so you worked with this as part of your lab, both pre-lab and as one of the first steps in lab. So I think I can um, <laughs> leave you to have understood this thoroughly, so let me just skip that. Um, if somehow you need something more, you can look at the... Um, you can look at, let me see here, how do I get to what I want? Uh, you can look at the pre-lab answer. So in the pre-lab answers, I've done some detailed work in terms of uh, showing that it has a unit of time. So if somehow how you weren't at the lab, I think almost uh, everyone was, but if somehow, if you weren't at the lab, and uh, you still have access to this uh, pre-lab answer, and you do... Um, It'll basically answer that question when I look, yeah. So here, um, at least in terms of the time constant units, um, I work it out here, you can look at that. Um, and uh, in terms of its uh, significance, I mean, so uh, in the lab you saw that it's the time constant is amount of time and significant change occurs, like a change by either factor of three or difference of two thirds or something along that line. Um, so, okay, uh, let me keep going with uh, question four. It is typical in physics classes to work with idealized objects. Yeah, uh, capacitor inductors are no exception. Um, but in practice, there are always ways in which both capacitors and inductors can be non ideal. I wonder if your question covers some of that. Um, Because if your textbook covers some of the uh, model parameters you would have to take into account in your model, that would be nice. Uh, otherwise, I can just speak out loud. Because uh, <laughs> um, your textbook might not be mentioning. I mean, it's, you know, it's the kind of thing that if you're in a lab setting and you're doing real measurements and you're trying to figure out um, what's happening. You might be able to figure it out. But um, I can also just uh, say that a lot. And to a degree, it's a, a kind of an open-ended question in the sense that because um, you are basically asked to uh, come up with ways in which an idealized circuit component might behave in ways that are different from that idealization. Um, so, <laughs> so, so it is open-ended. It's not as though there's one right answer. But let me just uh, describe some parts of the model answer that you will see in the solution. So let me just uh, carve out some space for capacitor, which can be modeled as parallel plate capacitor. Um, and Almost always, they will have some uh, dielectric material in between the two plates. So I think it's good to have uh, some visual representation of that so that I don't forget that. And all the non-ideal aspects of capacitor can be 
uh, discussed within this model. And we have inductor, which may have some ways in which it behaves non-ideally. And I guess inductor is best uh, idealized as a kind of a solenoid, a coil of wires. I mean, the circuit diagram for solenoid kind of reminds you of that. And um, I guess if you had to, um, so you, you've seen it in the inductors, you've seen in the lab. So it's uh, usually not going to be a vacuum coil of wires. It's going to be coil of wires wrapped around something that's, uh, that's uh, ferromagnetic uh, so that you maximize your inductance. So as you look at that, um, so capacitor has a kind of um, two um, simple ways where they might fail or um, not do the things that they you would expect it to. So this is uh, dielectric and it's supposed to be an insulator. Now, uh, some insulators have sometimes, this, um, so, you know, it's supposed to have resistance going to infinity. And uh, if you look up resistivity of some insulating material like carbon or whatever, some of them, uh, their resistivity is high, but not infinity. So even though it's uh, modeled as an insulator, maybe it conducts a little bit of current. That's uh, a possible thing to happen in a perfectly functioning capacitor. So maybe it needs to be modeled with a register, a large value register in parallel. That's one thing that could happen. Uh, not all that common, at least not in um, like low voltage, reasonably uh, moderately high current application. Like, you know, it's one thing if you have to worry about current or peak one peer, but uh, if you are not having to worry about that, then this is not the part that usually causes issues. Um, the other way um, capacitor can fail, it also relates to dielectric. And what it can do is it can break down. If you apply high enough voltage, you could get basically uh, tearing of the molecules and ionizing it, basically have a, a electric current going through the inductor. And some an event like that will just uh, permanently break the capacitor. <laughs> so th those are some of the ways capacitor can fail. And I think in my experience building circuits, you are most of the time it's okay uh, treating capacitors as being ideal because both of these non-ideal aspects are not all that significant. Um, inductor is the one where it can be um, more challenging. So it's got uh, at least two pieces that can, two major pieces that can introduce non-idealization. So one is that it's made up of wires. Um, like that's the important part of inductor. You can't have inductor without the coil of wires. And the uh, wires, they have resistance. I mean, unless you build it out of superconducting wire, but uh, it's a highly specialized research application. Most of the time you're building inductor, you are building it out of copper wires, it'll have resistance. So even though when we model inductor, we model it as pure inductance, you are never going to have pure inductance. You will almost always have to have a, a resistance that's in series with the inductor, either because you put a register in series or because the uh, you are uh, like thinking of the black box model, this is your physical inductor and you are uh, modeling the you are modeling the, the the resistance of the wire as this regist register in series um, so that's one big piece that will come out oftentimes because a lot of the inductor circuits also tend to work with smaller values of resistance and long enough a piece of wire it can easily have like one to five ohms and uh, you might be at a uh, other uh, regime with other component values where that matters. And the other one that um, I guess in time dependent circuit, it's not as much of an issue. It can be an issue in AC circuits. And I don't even remember if I mentioned it in my model answer, but this uh, ferromagnetic core uh, can introduce energy losses. And uh, it's uh, more of an issue in an AC circuit. It comes down to like in an AC circuit with a flipping current. Um, the, so it will be uh, magnetizing this ferromagnetic material in opposite directions. And that involves flipping magnetic domains. And um, that can, there's a, like a friction of things that can generate heat. 
and uh, that energy has to come from somewhere and it'll have some kind of damping effect. Uh, like if you have an LC circuit, um, this could be a source of damping that reduces current over time. Um, so that's another thing that could happen in the inductor. I think it's uh, less of an issue unless you are building your own, like, uh, so the ferromagnetic core you've seen in lab, uh, they are designed to minimize this. They are deliberately not conductive. Um, Oh, oh, also, uh, if a ferromagnetic material is conducting, it can induce eddy current, which is another uh, magnetic uh, losses. Uh, let me say magnetic domain flipping or eddy current if it's conductive. So the material we have for the toroid ferromagnetic core, it's uh, non-conducting. Uh, it's like broken up in a way that minimizes eddy current. But like if you are building your own makeshift inductor using like uh, iron core, then it'll be far less efficient because of the current for one and the other ways in which it uh, um, hasn't taken into account the non-ideal things that this can introduce. So, so yeah, that's question four. So again, this particular set of questions, they, um, yeah, the, I didn't use any of the textable questions because I didn't see ones I liked. <laughs> so, I hope I covered enough of it uh, at this session.